Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will present our recent work called Solos, which is a scalable and robust block store. My name is Yang Wang, and this is a joint work with my colleagues at the University of Texas. One of the first priority goals of a storage system. Hello? OK. OK. Uh, one of the first priority goals of a storage system is not to lose data. Even in the past, when there's a local disk directly attached to a machine, this is not an easy task. People have developed tools like FS Check, Ion File System, and ZFS to achieve this goal. Now, this problem becomes even more difficult since many users store their data in a remote data center in which there are many machines and a very complex software stack to manage data. Both of these factors contribute to an increased probability of failures. To solve this problem, the goal of the SARS project is to add those robustness guarantees to the scalable storage systems. People have developed a lot of scalable systems in the past. For example, the Google's GFS and Bigtable, then the open source version of them, the DFS and HBase, and then the Windows Azure system, and also many, many others. These systems are usually designed to tolerate uh, crash failures plus uh, certain kinds of disk corruptions by using simple checksums. Uh, however, as we all know that failures are not just uh, crashes. The memory can have corruptions, CPU can have errors, and the software can have bugs. Therefore, on the other hand, people have developed uh, strong protection techniques to tolerate arbitrary failures. The examples include the Byzantine fault tolerance techniques and end-to-end -to -end verification techniques and also many others. But the problem is that, as I will show you in a few slides, uh, these strong protection techniques do not fit very well together with the underlying scalable storage systems. And instead, the design of SOLAS is based on scalable designs uh, that fit well with the underlying scalable storage systems. In Lord's talk, I will present SOLAS, a robust and scalable block store that achieve all the following. So first, it maintains the scalability designs from the existing systems while providing stronger robustness guarantees. Specifically, a client will never read the corrupted data no matter what happens to the servers. And second, uh, as long as the number of failures in the server is under a certain threshold, uh, the system can ensure data durability and availability. And finally, perhaps surprisingly, uh, the additional robustness does not come at the cost of performance. And actually, SOLAS can outperform existing systems in certain cases, and it can provide a comparable throughput in almost all the other cases. Let me go to the design of SOLAS for now. So to start with, people have developed a, a lot of distributed storage systems for different purposes. For example, the distributed file systems, different uh, key value stores, block stores, and databases. SOLAS is designed for a block store, however, Unfortunately, we don't know a scalability design for a block store. Therefore, we start with the back second best approach. We start from a distributed key value store, uh, since mapping a key to a value is essentially the same as mapping a block ID to its corresponding data. So first, uh, let me present an overview of the scalable architecture used in almost all the scalable key value stores. So on the right side, you could say there's a single or a few metadata servers. And the designers usually make sure that the metadata transfer is very infrequent, so that the metadata server will not become the bottleneck of the system. And second, client can usually access the data servers directly and in parallel. That's how the system can get its scalability. And the third, data is usually replicated for availability and durability. But as I said before, uh, these systems are usually designed to tolerate just the crash failures. And finally, if we look at more into this uh, replication protocol, uh, we, find, damn it, we find a node which we call computing node uh, simply because they don't have any persistent storage and they store all of their data on the storage node. The examples of the computing node include the tablet server in Bigtable, the region server in HBase, and also the extend manager in the Windows Azure and maybe others. And uh, they usually perform tasks like uh, forwarding data from the clients to the storage nodes. Uh, and sometimes they can perform tasks by themselves, like uh, garbage collecting data on the storage nodes. However, when we try to build a scalable block store over this architecture, we have found three problems. First, 
This kind of architecture does not provide any ordering guarantees for write operations. And uh, second, a uh, single error, single corruption at a computing node can corrupt the data on all the storage nodes. Uh, and finally, when such kind of corruption happens, the client has no way of verifying whether the data it reads is correct or not. Uh, so let's take a close look at uh, these three problems. So first, there's no ordering guarantees for write requests. However, block store requires these ordering guarantees uh, to implement the barrier semantics, uh, which means that the client should be able to mark some of its write requests as a barrier, and the system should ensure that all request, uh, the barrier request is executed after all the previous requests have completed and before all the re following requests have started. Uh, this barrier semantic is uh, essential to guarantee the consistency for systems like uh, journaling file system or database. However, uh, this semantics can be violated in the existing architecture. For example, if the client sends request one to a server and send request two, uh, with a barrier to another server in parallel, it's possible that uh, the client failure plus the network failure uh, can cause write one to be lost, while write two is still received and executed by the corresponding server. This behavior violates the barrier semantics, and this can cause severe damage uh, as shown in previous works like our fast system. In the worst case, it can cause the client to lose all of its data. The second problem is that Despite the fact that the data is replicated on multiple storage nodes, a single failure at the computing node can corrupt all replicas of the data on storage node as well. And the third problem is that when such kind of corruption happens, the client has no way of even realizing it. This problem is exacerbated by the fact that uh, for performance reasons, most of the systems choose to read data from just one node. Uh, therefore, a single corruption at either the computing node or the storage node can cause the client to read corrupted data. One may wonder, does a simple checksum can prevent this case from happening? Uh, actually, it cannot prevent errors in other sy subsystems like in memory or in CPU. So, to solve these problems, we have designed Solus. So first, as I have mentioned before, Solus inherits this scalable design from the previous systems to achieve its scalability. And second, it's a block store. It provides many virtual disks to different users. Uh, uh, this is demonstrated by the success of Amazon's Elastic Block Store. And uh, here, the user can mount a single disk through its block driver. And here, we'll zoom that uh, a disk can be only mounted by a single driver. This is also the model used in Amazon's EBS. Uh, then, at the block driver level, we have introduced the end-to-end -end verification techniques uh, so that uh, the client will not read any corrupted data no matter what happens to the servers. And then we introduced the pipeline commit protocol between the block drivers and the servers to ensure the barrier semantics uh, despite the parallel writes. And finally, we have introduced the active storage inside the replication protocol to eliminate single points of failures uh, in computing nodes. And the Solus is designed to tolerate almost arbitrary failures, but we assume that a node will not uh, impersonate another node. We believe this is a reasonable assumption in a well-controlled data center. And then we'll present pipeline commit and active storage, but because of time limit, uh, I will not present end-to-end -end verification in more detail. So the goal of the pipeline per commit protocol is to ensure barrier semantics despite parallel writes. Uh, there's actually a very naive solution to this problem, uh, is that the block driver can wait at a barrier until all previous requests have completed. And of course, this approach just loses all the parallelisms the, uh, the previous systems try to achieve. And if we look more into this uh, barrier semantic, it looks actually looks uh, very similar to a distributed transaction. And as we all know, there's a solution to that, which is a two-phase commit. So here, let me first start with the two-phase commit and then we'll present what are the problems that make it does not fully work. So let me use an example here. Uh, assume there's a block driver and there are multiple servers. Recall that uh, here servers is actually a replicated group, but here I will just show one block for simplicity. And let's say a, a driver has multiple outstanding requests, and among them, some of them are barriers. Okay? In this case, the driver will split the request into two transactions. 
or what we call batches, and send them to corresponding servers. And these servers will lock them to disk and send commit, send prepare to the leader, and finally the leader will ask them to commit. Uh, until here, this is a standard two-phase commit protocol. The problem with uh, this protocol is that uh, even in this case, uh, it's possible that the first transaction is aborted or lost because of failures, while the second transaction is committed. This again, while it's uh, barrier semantic, uh, the fundamental reason is that uh, two-phase commit only guarantees atomicity inside a single transaction, but it does not provide any ordering guarantees between different transactions. So to solve this problem, we have introduced the two pipeline commit. The key of the two pipeline commit is that we execute the second phase, the commit phase in sequential. To achieve that, before a leader decides to commit, uh, it must wait for a notification from the leader of the previous transaction. Though we did the second phase in sequential, we can still perform the first phase, the prepare phase in parallel. In this phase, uh, the driver sends the large bulk of data over the network to the servers, and the servers uh, log them to disk. So the benefit of this protocol is that uh, by still parallelizing the first phase, uh, Solus can still achieve its, uh, can still inherit the scalability and parallelism from the existing sec architecture, while executing the second phase in sequential allows Solus to achieve its uh, barrier semantics while not hurting the performance of the system, since in the second phase, the message and the execution are both very small. Okay, then let me go to active storage. The goal of an active storage protocol is to prevent a single computing node from corrupting data. Okay, again, there's a well-known solution to this problem, which is the Byzantine fault tolerance technique, but the problem with this is that uh, it increases the replication cost to at least 2F plus 1 ex execution replicas to be functional. And most existing systems just use F plus 1 replicas to tolerate F failures. And of course, uh, Solus does not want to increase this cost. So Solus solution in this case is to separate the safety and the liveness. To, and actually, F plus 1 replicas is enough to achieve safety. We say that for any updates to the storage node, it must be agreed upon by all the F plus 1 replicas of the computing nodes. Uh, this way, as long as there are no more than F failures in computing nodes, uh, the system is safe. But the problem with this approach is how to guarantee availability and liveness uh, when, the, when some failures happen in the computing nodes. In this case, the system cannot make progress. Okay. This problem is difficult uh, because we may not even know which node is 40, since a majority of them can be 40 in almost the arbitrary ways. So Solus uh, leverages the fact that uh, the computing node does not have any state, it only have software states, so we can replace all the computing nodes with a new set of the nodes, and the new nodes can just uh, recover their states from the underlying storage node. But before they continue, Solus will ask the new sets of node, computing nodes to agree on the current status of the storage node. If they can reach agreement, then we are good, then we can move on. And if they cannot reach agreement, uh, Solus will perform this replacement again until we can reach agreement. Okay. You may wonder that whether such kind of increased replication hurts the performance of the system, and actually the answer is no. Actually, active storage allows Solus to achieve better performance in certain cases. Uh, the reason is that uh, by replicating computing nodes, now we can co-locate the computing node and the storage node on the same local machine. This can save a lot of network bandwidth for tasks like garbage collection. For example, in garbage collection, now the computing node can just uh, read data from its local storage node, perform some computation, and then write the results to the local storage nodes. This eliminates all the network transfers during garbage collection. And finally, let me go to evaluation. In the evaluation, we hope to answer three questions. So first, is SARS robust against expected failures? Okay. Second, what is the overhead of SARS to achieve the strong robustness guarantees? And third, does the overhead grow with the scale of the system? We hope the answer is no. Then uh, our system is as scalable as the previous systems. So to evaluate the robustness of the system, we inject failures into the different, different components of the system. Uh, here I just show a subset of the results. For example, we inject the disk failures into the storage node, and then we inject the memory corruptions into the computing nodes. 
and we compile Solus to HBase, which is the code base uh, which Solus descends from. And we show two properties here, safety and liveness. For safety, we mean that uh, uh, the block driver or the client will never read corrupted data. And for liveness, we mean that uh, for any read or write request, it will eventually complete. So first, we can see that Solus is always safe no matter what happens to the servers. And it is live when there are no more than two failures in either storage nodes or computing nodes. And if we will look at HBase, HBase performs quite well for disk failures because it has on disk uh, checksums to protect its data. However, it does not provide any guarantees when there are memory corruptions uh, in the computing nodes. Okay. Then let me present the uh, overhead of Solus. Actually, we did two sets of experiment uh, to compile Solus and HBase in this case. In the first set, we run both systems in an environment where there are sufficient network bandwidth. In this case, active storage does not help uh, Solus a lot. And of course, in this case, Solus is uh, slightly slower than HBase in almost all of our read and write experiments. Then when we switch to an environment when the network bandwidth is very limited, then we can see that Solus can actually outperform HBase by 74%. The reason is that uh, Solus can reduce the network consumption by less than 50% compared to HBase because it eliminates all the uh, network transfer transfers in garbage collection by using active storage protocol. And finally, uh, let's answer this question. Does the overhead grow with the scale of the system? If the answer is no, then our system can achieve the same level of scalability as the original system, which is HBase. Uh, so to perform this experiment, we rented more than about 100 machines on Amazon's EC2. And again, we performed two sets of experiment. In the first set, we run the system with nine servers, which were called a small scale experiment. And uh, in the second set, we run it with 108 servers, which were called a large scale experiment. Uh, the Y axis here is the throughput uh, we achieved per server, actually. So first, here we can see that for sequential wide workload, uh, the throughput of both HBase and the Solus almost does not change with the scale of the system. This means that both systems uh, can achieve almost the perfect scalability under the sequential write workload. But here you can also see that Solus is slightly slower than HBase because in this uh, environment also we have sufficient network bandwidth uh, then when we move to the random write workload, we can see that Solus is slower than HBase by about 28% uh, in both the small and big experiment. This again means that the overhead of Solus does not grow with the system, which means the Solus is almost as scalable as HBase. But here you can also notice that both HBase and Solus experience a significant performance drop uh, when the scale of the system grows. The reason is that uh, for, random for random workload, the client needs to distribute its uh, request to multiple servers. And of course, in a large scale experiment, it needs to distribute its transaction to more servers, uh, which results in a small, smaller I.O. compared to in a, a small experiment. This, of course, hurts the throughput of the system. Finally, let me conclude. So we have built Solus, a scalable and robust block store. Uh, and surprisingly, high robustness does not come with the cost of performance. To achieve that, we use the several techniques. For example, we use the pipeline commit to allow write to be processed in parallel while providing ordering guarantees to write operations. And we also use active storage to eliminate a single point of failures in the system uh, while consuming less network bandwidth. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. If there's any questions, please come up to the microphones. Otherwise, I have kind of one, which is, um, I know that you um, uh, sort of patterned your use case on the Amazon EBS uh, model, which has a single writer right. um, kind of model. Have you looked since doing this work at uh, supporting multiple writers? Right. Okay. Wait. Okay, 
So I think the question here is, uh, so for a block, like, block store like storage, uh, a single driver per volume is a reasonable assumption. But for example, if we want to extend Salas to support uh, uh, multiple clients, uh, <coughs> uh, for example, in a key value store, how to support that? Uh, currently, actually, we don't know a perfect solution for that. Uh, the real problem is actually from the third part, which I haven't talked about, come from the scalable end-to-end -end checks. The fundamental problem is that uh, uh, if I modify something and I want to let you know and let you modify, it, uh, verify it, uh, how to do it in a scalable way. Again, we don't know a perfect solution here, but at least uh, uh, we have two trade-offs here. So first, uh, we can give up linear reliability to go to cultural consistency or folk drawing cultural, uh, as shown in previous works like Depot. Uh, then we can still achieve scalability. But of course, then this cannot be used uh, for any linear reliable systems. Uh, or we can give up scalability to some extent. We can say there's a single serialization point so that uh, all clients of the same table can send your request through that single serialization point uh, by using the protocol like, uh, as, like Sander, which is also a previous work. So this uh, limits the scalability inside a single table, but still we can get a scalability across different tables. Okay. I actually have one more question. So, um, if I recall, your fault tolerance or your fault injection model involved a kind of random ins inserting random faults into the system. But a lot of times, you know, in real systems, there's correlated failures. You also mentioned that the ratio of the network to the storage bandwidth affected the performance as well. So, in a situation where you might end up with disks failing and entering recovery at the same time, you might have less bandwidth because switches have failed. Do you have any sense of sort of um, like basically how your system performs? during recovery in these kind of cases? Okay. Uh, so actually, uh, we have performed the recovery experiment for just the robustness, uh, but unfortunately, we haven't done any large-scale experiment for recovery. Uh, but our network bandwidth or disk usage in the recovery should be almost uh, similar as the original edge base. So still, at least it should not hurt the recovery of the original protocol. That's my answer for now. So, of course, in the future, we plan to do more experiments uh, uh, when we have more machines. Thank you.